Good morning, everybody. I don't know how you're feeling, but when the sun's out like this, I am a happy camper. It is good to see the sun out. It is good to see your smiling faces again this morning. I missed you all last week. Um, I got to see some of you last night, which was nice, but there's something, something different about Sunday morning. So anyway, welcome all of you who are visiting first time or who have been here a while or who haven't been here in a while and are visiting again. Good to see you this morning. Thank you all for joining us online as well. Welcome to Bethany Christian Church where, you know, there's plenty of places you could be on a Sunday morning, but I'm super glad that you chose to be here. It means a lot to me and as well as to our members and leadership here at the church. So as we began two weeks ago, uh, we're on our vision series for the year, Bridge. And last week, unfortunately, we had a little mishap and I got sick. So we're picking up where we left off. This is technically week two of the series, but it's uh, kind of got a, a nice interlude last week with some testimonies, beautiful things that God is doing in the lives of the folks who go here, at church, go here to church. And so, yes, yeah, so two weeks ago, <clears throat> had a series, the, the first sermon of the series was, was called Blueprint. And I asked three questions that we were going to consider. Why do we exist as a church? Where are we going? And how do we get there? And so I kind of painted a general overview of the vision. I said that there are four things that we're going to be focusing on this year in order to adopt a discipleship path, right? Those things were connect, grow, serve, and share. What the heck do those mean? Connect. Well, we need to connect with other believers. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are necessarily called into community with each other. And not just community on a one and every once in a while time basis. No, God, God's intention for the church was for us to be in constant contact with one another, to be in community, an intentional community, one which that is transformative to our walk with God. We're to grow. What, is, what does it mean to grow? To grow in our faith, to be challenged, to be instructed, to push back against what we're instructed, but to grow nonetheless. And then we're to serve. Serve who? Serve the church and serve our community. And then share. To share the gospel. To share the good news that Jesus has given to us with our neighbors. And so, our first week of the series, we talked about connection. We talked about connecting with other believers so that we might have something meaningful to invite our neighbors to. So today we're going to talk about what it means to grow in our faith and the ways that we're going to do that this year. Before we get there, let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks that you are an awesome God and that you have delivered a vision to those who came and sought out what it is that you have for us to do here at Bethany Christian Church and in Fort Washington, Maryland, Springs, Maryland. God, we give you thanks that you were near to us, that you love us, and that you are here to be leading ahead of us, supporting us, behind us, and walking alongside us as we move into this year, 2020. We give you thanks. Amen. Well, first, one thing I should say is Happy Black History Month. What a wonderful time to celebrate those who have come before us, our African-American brothers and sisters who have contributed to society in myriad ways. I just want to celebrate that. Let's give God thanks for that. If you're interested uh, in the tower notes uh, that we have out in the lobby, or you may have been emailed them, uh, I wrote a little story about my visit to uh, Booker T. Washington's uh, childhood home um, up until he was nine years old, where uh, Brianna and I visited and learned a lot of really interesting things. So uh, you can read a little bit about it in the tower notes, but uh, if you'd like to hear more about it, I'd love to talk to you about it, tell you what I learned. He's a very exceptional person. 
So, you know, as a kid, uh, I hit puberty a lot later than people my age. And uh, unfortunately, up until the end of middle school, I remember being on the smaller side of the guys in my class. And I had this, like, squeaky, high-pitched voice to match. Now, don't get me wrong, I wasn't the smallest person at my school, but I'd say I was just the right size to be noticeable. And not in a good way. I wasn't really able to hide, but I also wasn't really able to defend myself. And because I knew that about myself, um, I don't know if it was a matter of circumstances or if I was doing it on purpose, but I made friends with some pretty big people, like big guys. Um, you know, so if push came to shove, at the end of the day, um, I'd, have my, I'd have my protection and a little guy like me. Um, anyways, I, in middle school, I, I started playing the saxophone in the band. Um, I got pretty good grades. And uh, as you might guess, for, for many of those reasons and more, I was bullied quite a bit. Um, but, but sometime between middle school and high school, over the course of a few months, this amazing thing happened. I like gained 20 pounds. Um, I got fairly close to as tall as I am today. And looking back on it, it was this really cool mixture of biology and exercise and eating and like all of these other amazing things that God does in order for me to grow in the same way that I'm sure many of you have experienced as you were growing up. But of all the things I could tell you about that time in my life, the thing I don't think I will ever forget is just how painful growing is. I mean, I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would like have this shooting pain in my shin. In my best guess, like, I, don't, I don't know much about that. The doctors and nurses in our congregation probably tell you better, but I, I'm, I'm guessing it was because I was growing so fast, my bones were growing so quickly that they would just hurt. And it wasn't quite like they were sore or like someone had kicked me in the shins at soccer or something. It was like this odd pain that I don't know I've ever felt since or that I'll ever feel again. They were growing pains, right? So with that in mind, let's go ahead and open our text, first text for today. Um, I'm going backwards, so we're going to start with Colossians chapter 2. If you're uh, using a pew Bible, that's going to be on page 1143, 1143. And we'll go ahead and read that together. I'm going to be reading from the New International Version starting in verse 2, 1143 in your few Bibles. And it goes like this. Paul says, My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments, for though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Again I say, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith. So in the previous chapter to this letter that Paul is writing to the Colossians, in verses 17 and 18, he says this, Jesus Christ is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. The head of the body, the church. So if we are to continue to live our lives in Jesus, rooted and built up in him, right, we must consider this body 
that you and I and everyone is a part of. Jesus is the head of that body, but we as the church, as other parts of the body, are necessarily called into community with one another. We as the church, the body of Christ, are called to support the head by functioning as a healthy body. But pastor, how do we function as a healthy body? Well, you might remember from last week, we asked those three questions, right? Why do we exist as a church? Where are we going? And how do we get there? The vision team agreed that this year we are going to run an experiment. We agreed that the reason we will exist as a church, the answer to our first question, is to serve the young people and the parents of our immediate communities. We cast the vision that we will have 100 people regularly attending worship by the end of this year. And really, that just means that one person, starting from two weeks ago, needs to stay in worship every week until the end of the year. That was 49 new people to add, whether it be here or online, right? We said that five new families would join the church this year. And we said that we're going to get there by connecting with other believers, growing in our faith, serving the church and serving our community, and sharing the good news of Jesus. So last week, I introduced this idea of a life group as a point of connection with other believers. And even though it was like this brief introduction, we've already had a handful of people sign up out on the welcome desk. But today I'd like to return to the topic to further emphasize the importance of these groups and to help make it easier to understand what their purpose is. We're going to do a little bit more bouncing around in the New Testament. If you could open to the book of Acts, chapter 2, we're going to be on Pew Bible, page 1057, 1057. I was inspired by this text as it gives us a clear picture of what they were doing in the beginning. What, what was the church up to immediately after they received the Holy Spirit? So Acts chapter 2, verses 36 to 47. And so Peter says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said, and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property, possession. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I want you all to close your eyes for a moment. Now imagine you're with the apostles. Jesus has been gone for some time now, and you are ready to receive this Holy Spirit that Jesus promised. And I mean, you're convinced 
that Jesus is who he said he was. There is no doubt in your mind. You watched your teacher and friend die by crucifixion. And then he came back from the dead. Now you've received the Holy Spirit, and Peter comes to lay out what the plan is. Open your eyes. The next thing you hear is a list that goes something like this. Devote yourself to the apostles' teaching. Live in fellowship with one another. Eat together. Pray. Pray alone, where no one will hear you or, or see you. But also, pray in community. Share everything you own with one another. Make sacrifices as others' needs arise. Meet together every day. That's what Peter said. And you can bet it sounded just as crazy to them as it does when we read it now. What Peter is calling the followers of Jesus to do is crazy. It's countercultural. And it requires us to deny ourselves for the sake of lifting others up. Now, look, I'm not here to tell you the specifics of how you need to live your life. Ultimately, that's between you and God. But what I want to encourage you in today is that it's in practices like these that the Christian life truly begins to take shape. Through the gospel, we are given the opportunity, better yet, the privilege, to live differently. Each of us is ordained by God, by the God of the universe, to both receive the fruits of God's Spirit and to share the fruits of God's Spirit. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus says, Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Or in the words of St. Francis that I mentioned earlier, it is in giving that you receive. And this is what life groups are designed for. Life groups are designed for you to receive the fruits of the Spirit and to share the fruits of the Spirit. These groups are designed for you to be in community with other believers. They're designed so that you will do precisely what Peter is calling the early church to do. To devote yourself to the way of Jesus and his teaching. To live in fellowship with one another. To eat together. To pray together. To make sacrifices for one another. To hold to encourage one another to explore your faith more deeply. Life groups are designed for you to be in community with other believers, but they are also designed so that you might grow in your faith. Now with this idea of growth in mind, let us turn to Genesis, chapter 32, verses 22 to 32. You'll find that on your pew Bible, page 33, all the way back to the one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. Jacob wrestles with God. Starting in verse 22, it says, That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower Jacob, he touched Jacob's hip socket so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered, 
Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But the man replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed Jacob. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. I really wish I had something clever to say about that last verse. I always find that a strange ending, but, you know. So you're probably wondering, Pastor, what does Jacob wrestling with God have to do with growth? What does it have to do with this sermon build? Well, what ends up happening with this experience is Jacob is given a new name, right? For those of you that are familiar with Jacob's story, you know that he has this older brother named Esau. And he's not that much older. They were twins, but Esau was born first, and Jacob came next. And Jacob was kind of a jerk to his older brother. He stole his birthright by tricking their blind dad. He manipulated people, and he was rewarded for it. He got a lot of things because he treated people poorly and manipulated them. And... That's where he gets his name. Jacob is a name for the supplanter or the usurper. He's someone who takes what is not rightfully his. So before Jacob finds himself wrestling with God by the river, a few chapters after this, he's running away from Esau because Esau is going towards Jacob. He doesn't know if Esau's mad. He doesn't understand what's going on, but he's like, my brother's probably going to kill me. So he's running away because he thinks he's still mad at him because of all the times that Jacob has tricked him out of food, out of his birthright. But after sending his family across the river, Jacob stays. He's alone. And it's in this weird wrestling match, right? I don't know. I, just, I find it weird. Some random guy just shows up and starts wrestling you. Okay. Maybe it's not weird, huh? But come to find out, the text tells us that Jacob ends up wrestling with God all night long. And Jacob, being the father of the 12 sons, who later become the 12 tribes of Israel, that represent the old kingdom of Israel, is named Israel by this figure that he's wrestling with all night. God gives him a new name. God says, you are no longer Jacob. You are no longer the supplanter. Your name is Israel because you were one that successfully, successfully wrestles with God and with humanity. And then the story tells us that God breaks his hip and he's left with a limp forever for the rest of his life. Pastor, what does that have to do with growth? Well, to be totally honest with you, I couldn't think of a better example of what it means to call yourself a Christian, if in fact you do claim that. Hopefully God is not going to leave you with a broken hip. But what I do know is that wrestling with God, wrestling with your life, wrestling with other people about life and about God, and about what we should be doing with our lives, that, in that wrestling, that is where true growth is found. That's where we are given a new name. That's where God might touch our hip socket and we'll never walk the same again. It's because wrestling with God means we'll never be the same again. In our life groups this year, just like when I was in the midst of my uncomfortable puberty, there will be growing pains. But I have to tell you, wrestling with God is worth it. Every time. 
Because at the end comes that blessing. This year, I want our top priority to be participating in life groups. But I also am going to offer more opportunities for growth in your faith. I understand life groups is not going to be possible for everyone. And so with that in mind, my plan is to have a quarterly class for new members of the church or people who are interested in joining the church to be educated in what it means to walk with God, what it means to wrestle with God. We'll also talk about the history of our denomination so people can learn about what the disciples of Christ are all about and how we got to where we are today. We'll have classes on other topics that you bring to me. And we'll also have other folks come in to teach us that I'll get to learn from, that we'll get to learn from together. People from all walks of life and different parts of the church. And through all that, we're going to interact a little differently. And we're going to serve faith. So after the service concludes, I encourage you, please go sign up for a life group. All I need is your name. Can we hear me now? Beautiful. Just hold it. So after the service, I would encourage you, please go sign up for a life group. I just need your name. I need the best way to get in contact with you and some kind of guesstimate at what your availability would be. And my intention is, is to make these life groups be people who live close to you so that it's not a gigantic inconvenience for you to have somebody host at their house or, you know, you don't have to drive from the other side of Maryland to come and join a life group here in Fort Washington. And so I encourage you, please, sign up for these. This is where the rubber hits the road in, the walk, in your walk as a Christian. Being in intentional community with other people is how you grow, is how you get to know God better. It's how you create meaningful relationships that will transform your life. And so, with that in mind, let's be about the business of wrestling with God so that we might be changed by God. Amen.